Welcome to the CEO Breakfast and Strategy Series hosted by the Schneider School of Business and Economics right here at St. Omer College. I'm Brian Brees, the president of the college, and it is my pure joy and delight to welcome you uh, to this uh, program this morning. This marks the second year that this series has been administered by the Schneider School of Business and Economics, which I think is a perfect home for this program. The Schneider School aims to be the intellectual hub for business in our region, providing world-class programs for undergraduate and graduate students and resources like the Center for Exceptional Leadership, the Center for Business, Economic Analysis, and the Strategic Research Institute. First and foremost, the Schneider School of Business is about sharing business intelligence with the people who are shaping our economy. You and our speakers are a very important part of that group. Now in its 22nd year, the CEO series provides area executives with the opportunity to hear from some of our top CEOs in the area. This resource is brought to you by steady and faithful and generous sponsors. Today, the presenting sponsor is Meyer Construction. Title sponsors are Johnson Financial Group, Davis Keelthal, Attorneys at Law, and Insight Publications. The sponsor for today's session is American Family Insurance. This series would not be possible without these generous sponsors. Can you please give a round of applause for these sponsors? When you think about these sponsors that are indicated here with these banners, uh, I want you to recognize that they are faithful. They have been supporting us for years on end, and, and we're grateful for that. Uh, I also just want to say by way of a program note, we're going to start the speaker. Tom would like to start a little bit earlier than usual because he's got a lot of really good content. So we're going to start a little bit sooner than usual. People are giggling. They know that he's got a lot of good content. So I'm really thrilled that we're going to have an extra time with our speaker today. But it is now my great privilege to introduce Father Mike Brennan uh, to come up and offer us grace. So we begin in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. As we anticipate the feast before us, the feast of Tom's wisdom, the feast set before us, let us first taste the sweetness of your love. Help those who are here assembled remember that this bread and drink for which we thank you is only a shadow of your gracious love. You feed our bodies with the fruits of the land, but also you feed our spirits with joy, our hearts with goodness and hope, our souls with peace and mercy. Let us partake of these fruits, let us partake of these and all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. In so doing, let us always save some to share with our brothers and sisters who still hunger, and always make room at our tables for those who still thirst. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. It's now my uh, great pure pleasure to introduce Tom Ely. Uh, until its sale last week to American Family Insurance, Tom led to Pier headquartered Ameriprise Auto and Home, a $1.1 billion direct-to-consumer personal lines insurer. He, uh, he joined in the spring of 2016 to turn the underperforming insurer around, which is exactly what he and his team did. He remains a consultant to American Family uh, through the year end. In addition to his executive role, he's a consultant and educator for Midwestern Graduate School of Business, Lake Forest. Tom earned his BA in economics from the University of Notre Dame, decent start, and a master's in business administration from the Harvard University. Today, Tom is presenting his topic, You're in a tur Turnaround, Whether You Know It or Not. Please welcome recently, he said, it says retired, but it's, he's not retired. Please welcome recently rewired <laughs> President and CEO of Ameriprise Auto and Home, Tom Ely. Tom. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to uh, correct a couple of things, though. Uh, Brian said CEO intelligence, Father Mike said Tom's wisdom, those are oxymorons, the very <laughs> definition of oxymorons, um, but I do want to thank St. Norbert College and the Schneider School of Business and Economics for hosting this CEO breakfast and strategy series. Uh, it's had a really good run until today. <laughs> uh, and hopefully the next speaker uh, will get you back on track. But it's a gift to the community, certainly to the business community of Green Bay. And speaking of gifts, uh, Dr. Brees mentioned American Family Insurance. Uh, talk about generous. Not only the session sponsor for today, but just spent over a billion dollars buying Ameriprise Auto and Home, uh, the company that I used to run uh, and am now rewired uh, from. So I actually want to introduce my successor. Could not have found a more worthy successor. Frankly, I'm humbled by who they selected to succeed me. Jesse Staffacre, 
just recently relocated her family over the summer from Madison. Jesse Staffaker, she and her husband Bob, her children Trent and Courtney, moved here. So please give a big round of applause to Jesse Staffaker, new president and CEO of Ameriprise Auto and Home. Great addition to the community. I also want to, we have another executive from Ameriprise here who is also new to the business community, the new chief operating officer of Ameriprise Auto and Home, Sharina Alley. Please, Sharina, please stand up. And I've got a bit of a fan club smattered throughout, so they usually laugh at my jokes, so if you don't, I will count on them uh, to laugh at my jokes. Uh, so Brian said that I wanted to start early because I have a lot of content. That's not actually why. <laughs> my team knows that one of my essential principles is you end the meeting on time. In fact, you end the meeting before people think it's going to end and you give them a snow day back. So my job today is to get you back to your gainful employment as quickly as possible. And what I'm going to talk about, uh, as I say, I still have more questions than answers. I'm just going to share with you my experiences. But I will say this, and I'm pretty confident in what I'm about to say. Never before in our history has your organization's success or your personal success depended more on your orientation toward change. There are four ways you can deal with change. You can resist it, you can adapt to it, you can embrace it, or you can create it. The first two are non-starters, uh, as we shall see. Embracing change is sufficient, but no longer going to guarantee your organization's success. I believe for you to succeed and your organization to succeed, you have to create change. Constant, barely controlled change. Barely controlled change. That's probably the most operative thing I'm going to say today. Not controlled change, but move fast and break things. So if you don't think and act every day like you are in a turnaround, Eventually, you will find yourself one in one. And it may be too late at that point. So today, I'm going to take you on a brief journey in three parts. The first part is called creating a well-lighted path. The second part is called executing without fear. And the third part is called turning yourself around through continuous learning. So. Let me turn it on. So this book came out in 1993 called Control Your Destiny or Someone Else Will. I read this book around that time. And it had a profound influence on every day for the rest of my professional life. And of course, it's the story of Jack Welch the CEO of General Electric. There was a passage in the book, a couple of pages, which really crystallized everything for me. He was named CEO in the fall of 1981. His first act, like any CEO, was to gather his leadership team. So he brought together all 120 of General Electric's corporate officers. And he got up before them. And he said the following. He said, we have got to turn this company around. And at that point, the audience went slack-jawed. General Electric had just had another record year of profits. Only nine companies in the Fortune 500 had more earnings than General Electric in the year, that he in the year before he became CEO. They were absolutely confused and befuddled. But what he saw that they didn't was the evanescence, the impermanence of General Electric's prosperity. And all he did over the next 20 years, he was the chief executive from 1981 to 2001. 
He was the original disruptor. He disrupted his own company, transformed that company three times over in 20 years, and increased the value of that company over 20 years. The math is correct, 4,000%. In 20 years. Fortune magazine named him the manager of the century in the 20th century. So I thought, okay, this is a person I can learn from. <laughs> this is a person I can learn from. And so he had certain principles. And I'm not going to go through the principles. By the way, the book is now very dated. I just told you everything you need to know about the book, don't read it. <laughs> By the way, I've read a lot of business books. I generally get the point in the first 20 pages and I put it down. I just gave you the book. But these were the principles that he espoused. And I'm not gonna talk about all of them. There's only one that really grabbed me and stayed with me for the rest of my professional life. And that is change before you have to. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're talk, going to talk about changing before you have to. Now my team knows that there is no meeting that I host that doesn't involve audience participation. So I thought I would warm us up to this topic by playing a little game I like to call Corporate Cautionary Tale, Tic-Tac-Toe. Now, I want to introduce somebody else to you who was instrumental to the turnaround of Ameriprise Auto and Home. A vice president of Auto and Home, my former chief of staff, and my execution muse, Christine Pascalucci. Christine, 25 years at Auto and Home, please stand up. Please stand up. Big round of applause. She hates me right now. <laughs> she hates the limelight. She's not a hugger either, although I think I've converted her now that I've rewired. She will at least hug me. But she once said, you ought to be a game show host. And I said, I am. The show is called The Price is Right. When you're an insurance company, you better get your prices right because you don't know your cost of goods sold until much later, many years later. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have you play along with me. So tell me which of these actually forms a tic-tac-toe of companies that are either dead or essentially dead. So who wants to tell me which of these represents companies that essentially are no longer with us. Yes, sir? Sears Compaq Tower Records. Here's the thing about this slide, there are no wrong answers. <laughs> but there are different answers for each. Anybody else? Anybody else see a three in a row that represents dead or essentially dead companies? Yes, sir. Sears, Netflix, and Blockbusters, because Disney came out with its streaming service and there are others who are eating into Netflix's line. Well, sir, they're not dead yet. <laughs> you said essentially. <laughs> oh, so you, you can predict the future. You, sir, I want to get to know. You, sir, need, I need to know you. Anybody else? OK, so let's start with one. Blockbuster, Kodak, Tower Records. I'm just going to pick on Kodak because it's where I grew up. I grew up in Rochester, New York. Kodak was a colossus in Rochester, New York. This is the company that invented digital photography in 1975. They did one thing right, they created change. The problem is they let it kill them because they ignored it. And that's one of the stories. And I know each of you in your own business, it's hard to see beyond your current success. All right, let's pick another one. Sears, Kodak, Borders. Let's pick on Sears. From the town that I spent 25 years in, Chicago. 
This is a company that, yes, still exists, but it's bankrupt and it's essentially dead. This is the company that, and this is also a number that's staggering. At the beginning of the 20th century, one out of every 10 private sector employee worked for Sears. 10% of the US workforce in the private sector worked for Sears at the beginning of the 20th century. This is the company that invented direct merchandising, the direct merchandising catalog. We all remember that. I remember a Christmas man going through that Sears catalog. It invented the credit card. It invented the in-store kiosk. By the way, it invented all state insurance, sold insurance at kiosks inside Sears, named it after one of their tires, the Allstate's tire. But this is a company that in 1993, they started to presage the decline of Sears. And in that article, it talked about the ones nipping at its heels. Who was nipping at Sears, uh, Sears's heels in the 90s? Walmart, for sure. The other one they mentioned also could be on this list today. Toys R Us. And by the way, in 1993, Amazon wasn't even a twinkle in Jeff Bezos' eyes. Didn't even mention Amazon because it didn't exist yet. So a lot of cautionary tales here. So we've talked about Blockbuster, Kodak, and Tower. We've talked about Sears, Kodak, and Borders. Which of the remaining ones of these have had a near-death experience? All of them. Even Netflix, before streaming, I have a feeling Netflix will be just fine. But in 2011, they decided they were going to split out their mail order DVD business from their streaming business. And at the same time, they raised their prices on their streaming business. The customer backlash almost killed the company. Reed Hastings, the CEO, unlike a lot of CEOs, he said, mea culpa. I screwed up. That was a stupid decision. I'm stuffing that genie back in the box. And look where they've gone since. General Electric. I heard somebody say General Electric. No longer vaunted GE at one time. No longer part of the 30 stocks that comprise the Dow Jones industrial average. Stock is in the, I'm not sure it's you know, even in the double digits anymore. So these are companies, some of them created change but couldn't see past it. One of those companies is Xerox, another company that experienced a near-death experience. One of my favorite cautionary tales. So this is the company that invented and launched the most successful, and again, this is not, not hyperbole, the most successful industrial product in history, the Xerox 914 copier. Not only that, the brilliance of its business model was, and this person who invented this business model went on to become the CEO in 1971. We're going to talk about Peter McCall in a minute. You couldn't buy a 914. You could only lease the 914. And you paid Xerox by the click, as it was called, by the page. Every page. And that then begot 100,000 salespeople. Imagine a company with a sales force of 100,000 people out on the corporate landscape convincing people to lease a Xerox 914. Now, Peter McCullough, the guy who invented that business model, didn't invent the 914, but invented the business model. Smart guy. They made him CEO. And so smart that he realized in 1971 that Xerox's dominance was not guaranteed through the 914. So you know what he did? He did something which a lot of companies are doing today, legacy companies and legacy industries. He set up what I'm going to call, and we're going to talk about later, a two-speed workforce. He said, I want to create a team far away from the corporate center. By the way, Xerox also founded in Rochester, New York. There is something about that town. <laughs> Failure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my mom would kill me for saying that. Big Rochester booster. I haven't been there since 18. But anyway, so he said, we're going to send some people out to Palo Alto, California. This is pre-Silicon Valley. And set up the Palo Alto Research Center, Park. Do you know what that team invented? Do you know what that team invented? What did it invent, John? Windows. Something close to Windows. 
something close to the mouse. It invented the personal computer. It invented laser printers. And it invented the ethernet. Again, they created change but couldn't monetize it. Because they were beholden to their salespeople. The salespeople said, where's the click? How do we get paid? Again, these stories are all over. Anybody else got a favorite company that has gone through a process like this and is now essentially a shell of its former self or doesn't exist anymore? Any others you can think of? The list is long. Blackberry, Blackberry good one. Palm. Palm, same, yep. Lots. I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> Sir, if you talk in this meeting, you have to repeat it. Bill said a couple he started. <laughs> I love an honest person. I don't know a successful entrepreneur who hasn't failed a lot. Uh, that's, again, move fast and break things. Execute without fear. It's the whole theme of this thing. Okay, enough of that. Enough of that. The best most concise, simplest, and most compelling definition I've heard of a leader is this. A leader articulates a clear vision and set of principles which become a well-lighted path that well-intentioned people can follow. I love that definition. We're all leaders in this room. We all think about leadership a lot. That, to me, is the best summary of a leader that I can think of. And we're going to go on this little journey of this well-lighted path. And it comes in four parts. Strategic vision, culture, alignment, and engagement. And through this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey we've been on at Ameriprise Auto and Home. Like most successful chief executives, you learn from your team. The first thing I wanted to do when I joined Auto and Home was get my team away from the office and facilitate an open and honest conversation about where we were, where we were headed, what stood in the way, what were the opportunities. I'm sure many of you have been in many sessions like that. It would have felt very familiar to you. But the thing that came out of that meeting which we knew we needed to achieve. If one thing came out of that meeting, it was the essence of who we were. Why do we exist as a business? What is our compelling value proposition that differentiates us? Who is our customer, and how are we going to attract and retain them? So the first thing we did is say we have got to chisel and hone and refine and put into simple words why we exist. So everybody, both inside and outside the company, has a crystal clear understanding of why we do what we do and how we're going to be successful at it. Now, here's the punchline. Vision is the easy part. We're going to get to alignment in a moment. But I once heard it said, and it makes absolute sense to me, that visionary companies are 1% vision plus 99% alignment. The vision part, I say it's easy. I'm obviously overstating the case. But that's actually the easiest thing to do, is to create this definition of who you are. It's aligning people to that and getting them to execute with abandon, to execute without fear, all in the same direction. That's the hard part. So this was the vision statement we came up with. And it's not going to seem like much to you. And I'm not going to bore you with what it means to auto and home. But this became a clarion call. And it crystallized and clarified everything we were doing and wanted to do. And this was it. Remember, Dr. Brees said we are a direct-to-consumer insurer. Yes. Not only that, our brand doesn't matter. Because we only distribute our insurance product through partners through other companies. We leverage their brand, the loyalty and emotion people have for that company's brand. So we create value. We actually decided 
that we could prove to companies that we could provide economic value, provable economic value. So we create value for our partners' brands by protecting what matters to their customers. So in this formulation, the customer, Foursquare, became the partner, not the policyholder. We changed our language. Consumer is policyholder, customer is partner. Everything we do is for the partner to drive accretive, provable economic value to their brand. And we do that. We do that. But this freed us in many ways. This freed us in many ways. I'm also going to tell you a quick story, though, that also speaks to my own leadership style. Again, I'm not saying it's the best leadership style. But when you're turning around a business, in some cases, you're running a democracy. And in some cases, you're running a benevolent dictatorship. So I said, I want this to be on every screensaver in the company. We have 1,800 people, roughly 1,000 in Green Bay, roughly 200 in Phoenix, in Las Vegas each, and another 400, we call them virtual office, around the country. I wanted this to be what people woke up to and what they saw every time they timed out on their computer. And there was a revolt because I took away people's family pictures. I took away their pet's pictures. I took away the pictures of where they just went. Teresa just came back from Italy. She would have had a picture of the Amalfi Coast on her screensaver. I said, that is not your real estate. That is my real estate. There's a lot of other stuff you can do in your workstation or your home office or your office office to personalize it. I want you to understand what we do and why we do it. Again, this is the easy part. So next comes culture. The brightest light you can shine on that well-lighted path. And also, the greatest alignment tool in the history of business. If you have the right culture, you do not need to manage people. The best alignment tool ever. Now, when I got to Auto and Home, we had a very distinct culture. It was a terrific culture. But there were some artifacts in that culture that were preventing us from taking the next step. We were thinking about certain things, and I hate to put it this way, we were thinking about certain things in the wrong way. So it started with redefining who we were and why we existed. Then it came to, OK, let's take the best we can in our culture, but let's move it forward. And so I'm not going to share with you all of the ins and outs, but in my very first town hall meeting, by the way, Jessie's about to go on her first week of town hall meetings. Uh, we do them or did them uh, in the fall uh, and it, in the spring, my two favorite weeks of the year. But in my first town hall meeting, I kind of held a mirror up to the company. Just like I told them from the very beginning, I'm not a Packer fan. I know that I've just alienated the entire audience. I said, I want to be honest. And the first thing is, when they would ask me the question, are you a Packer fan? I would say, no. I'm a Bear fan. Now, it's not easy being a Bears fan in Green Bay for many reasons, as you know. Mostly because you eat our lunch. It's just really aggravating. But I held this mirror up to the company. I said, this is the culture that we have today in my assessment. This is where I would like to take our culture. Not easy to change culture. But there were two things in particular that I knew I had to do to get us on the path, to get us on this well-lighted path. When I joined, we were a customer first at all cost company. When I joined, we were a growth at all cost company. I see my colleagues shaking their head. Now you might say, Tom, What's wrong with that? Customer satisfaction, growth, isn't that what every company craves? Sure, but like everything in life, it's moderation. And without boring you, uh, you know, about the economics of an insurance company, all I can tell you is this. An overweening focus on customer satisfaction and an obsession with growth are both very hazardous to the health of an insurance company. So I need to move us, take the best of those things, 
and move us to company first, but customer centric. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And I also had to move us from a growth focus to a results focus. How the heck do you do that? How do you have to do that? Hard. And by the way, in everything that I'm going to talk about, we never achieved everything 100%. You never do. That's the whole point. You just keep working at it. You keep grinding. So what I decided to do, though, is take something that was so well known and so well loved in the company and then co-opt it. Take something that was deeply embedded in the company but turn it on its ear and help people understand how it could be even better. So when I joined the company, about 10 years prior to joining the company, we had started a program called Handle with Care. And it was about customer retention. We were trying to improve our customer retention. And then that very program, honestly, and this is the best part of Auto and Home, seeped into the floorboards. It became part of the DNA of the company, this handle with care ethos that has been one of the hallmarks of the company. If I could bottle it and sell it, I would be rich. But again, it had some of these other aspects to it that were preventing us from moving forward. So how do you get alignment? Again, first you start with something that people know that you can build on that honors the past but helps you become a company of dreams, not memories. A company of dreams, not memories. So we started to build this campaign that eventually culminated literally in the house I'm going to show you. If you came to our lobby at Auto and Home, you will see this house, literally the embodiment of this house, in our lobby. And we used the house metaphor to take handle with care from one C, customer, to four C's. And again, something that people knew well and loved. And so it worked to at least capture their imagination. So we built this campaign and it unfolded over time. This is the house that we started to build. We wanted to create the imagery of the foundation is company first. You have to have a foundation of profitability to take care of the other three C's. Customers, colleagues, and the communities in which we live and work. If you're not profitable, you're not sustainable. If you're not sustainable, forget the rest of it. And by the way, the other way I helped folks understand this is I use the analogy of the oxygen mask on an airplane. I remember very distinctly, I didn't take my first airplane ride until I was in my 20s. And the first time I heard the flight attendant go through the safety protocol, the flight attendant said, I know you've heard this many, many, many times. And please put on your own oxygen mask before helping those around you. And the first time I heard that, that did not make sense to me. That did not make intuitive sense. Because at least the way I'm built, humans are built to help those around you before you help yourself. That's just generally how most of us are wired. But then it made perfect sense. I can't help my seatmate if I am not strong, if I am not capable. So we had to sort of change things. And it's hard. So I remember growing up in Rochester, New York, in our gritty urban backyard. One summer, we became the darlings of the neighborhood. We had a jewel, an 18-foot round, three-foot above-ground pool. <laughs> and all of my brothers and sisters, I have many brothers and sisters, and all of the neighborhood kids would come over. And do you remember doing this? You created the whirlpool, <laughs> right? You created the whirlpool. And you kept going and kept going until that whirlpool got really, really strong. And then someone says, reverse. <laughs> and you try to break the chain. You try to reverse the whirlpool. And it's hard. But once you get everybody moving in the same direction, you got it. That's what we were trying to do. That's what we were trying to do with company first, not customer first. I know that seems odd. But at least for an insurance company, that has to be the way you think. So. Then the walls of this house are the supports. We support our customers when they need us, when they need us most. The roof, the imagery of helping colleagues rise to their full potential. 
And then the door is opening more doors to the communities in which we live and work, being a great corporate citizen all over the country, because we're all over the country, not just here in Green Bay. And this is the actual house that we have sitting in our lobby. Now, that's all well and good, very pretty, sounds good, but still, how do you operationalize alignment? How do you get there? And so, I'm not a big fan of placards, corporate placards, you know, tacked to workstations or in offices or in someone's home office. I tend to use them uh, as, uh, you know, placemats. Uh, but we decided that for 1,800 people scattered across the country, we had to find a way to take this concept and really operationalize it. And so I bowed, and Christine uh, was a great partner in this regard. We decided to come up with something that everybody would have every year to guide them, to get this alignment, this 99% alignment. So it starts with the four pillars. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. The four pillars of any company are strategy, structure, process, and people. It all comes down to those four things. But that's not really inspirational. That's kind of corporate speak. Like, remember, we're a company of 1,800 people, a lot of frontline associates in care centers, claims adjusters, strategy, structure, process, and people doesn't mean anything to them. So we said, what are four different words for these four things that will start to resonate a little bit more? Something they can maybe sink their teeth into a little bit more. So it became modernize, integrate, simplify, and develop. But even that, ain't compelling. So we said, what questions do we want people to ask of themselves every day, every day, as they think about these four things? And it became, does it profitably solve a customer problem? Is it cross-functional? Does it simplify a process? Does it help us learn and grow? That's something that people said, okay, that, those are questions I think I can answer or help answer in my job every day. And again, the last one, does it help us learn and grow? Companies today with winning cultures have two things. They've mastered change and they've mastered learning. They are change organizations and they are learning organizations. But none of this matters if it's not pointed towards goals and objectives. So every year with this alignment laminate, we would have a different set of objectives. And honestly, they were very consistent objectives from one year to the next. It didn't change a lot. As most great companies, they keep it simple and they keep it consistent. So we had desired outcomes. Not gonna bore you with the desired outcomes. But here's how we got real alignment. And like I said, we never did everything 100%. We never got it all right. Maybe we didn't even get close, but we tried. And one of the ways that we made this real to embed it in the company is we made sure that everybody had goals and objectives, annual goals and objectives that linked into, tied to directly, one or more of these desired objectives. And that's how you create a direct line of sight between what you do every day in your job and how the company succeeds. And so, I know I'm going into how the sausage is made, but there is no detail that is unimportant from my seat. I don't know a chief executive who gets to say, hey, I'm not into the details. That's, that's something, I just delegate. Yeah, you gotta delegate, but there's no detail that's unimportant. So this alignment laminate became something, again, year after year, helped the company gain this alignment to reverse that whirlpool. And our results came along with it. It's one of the reasons why American Family found us attractive. So we've talked about strategic vision, we've talked about culture, we've talked about alignment. Nothing happens until you get out there. Leadership is a contact sport. 
And my team will tell you that again, I'm not saying my leadership style is the right one, but my interpretation of leadership is it's a contact sport. And you've got to be highly engaged. And you've got to get your own data. And you've got to learn from people from the shop floor all the way up to your leadership team. Let me ask a question. What single activity do you do the most? Where do you spend most of your time in a given day? This is not rhetorical. <laughs> what single activity do you do the most of in a given day? Where are you at work most of the time? You are in a meeting. Who said that? Thank you, sir. You are in a meeting. Not everybody in this room, but in most, certainly professional settings, most companies, it's documented, people spend about 70% of their time in meetings. I hate meetings. I hate them. They are a waste of time. Colossal waste of time. But they're essential. They ain't going away. So if this is where you're gonna do your engagement, most of your engagement, you better get it right. Make it a darn good meeting. So guess what? The guy who hates placards, we created more placards. <laughs> These two things are in a plastic stand-up, flip side, in every conference room at Auto and Home. Again, I'm not gonna tell you that everybody follows them. Even I sometimes forget. But most of the time, I am definitely the process person in a meeting. Meetings, because they are never going away and they're the unit of accounting, so to speak, and how business gets done. So it started with some simple stuff. The first question is, is there a compelling reason for the meeting? Is there any other way more efficiently that we can accomplish what we think we're gonna accomplish in this meeting. Okay, let's say we gotta have the meeting. Pick an owner. Sounds simple. One person has to own it. Then, who should be in that meeting? People say, oh my God, I'm in so many meetings. Please, do I have to go to one more meeting? And then the first meeting they're excluded from? I gotta be in that meeting. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. If you ain't essential to the discussion, you're out. You're out. Duration. Good God. 30 minutes. That's it. That's all you get. You have to show cause why that meeting is more than 30 minutes. And it ain't going to be a meeting to decide what we're going to discuss in our next meeting. It's going to meeting, be a meeting to decide something. The other thing is, pre-reads, the bane of my existence. We would go into meetings early on, and guess what happens? It's like you're at a drive-in movie. Everybody's looking at the screen. No one's talking to each other because someone is slavishly going through every bullet point in the PowerPoint pre-read that should have been read before the meeting. So meeting participants have an obligation too. Read the darn material in advance. Owner has to get it to you far enough in advance, but you gotta read it in advance. We are not coming into this meeting and go through a PowerPoint. We're gonna have a conversation. For participants also, treat it like there's a ban on electronic devices, and then make sure you speak your piece in the meeting. Remember I said that sometimes you gotta be a benevolent dictatorship, not in a meeting. That's where it's a democracy. And everybody has a voice vote. And just like in this great country of ours, it is your obligation as a citizen to vote. It is your obligation as a part of this company to raise your voice and vote with your voice. Now, I may overrule you, but I wanna hear what you have to say. I retain supermajority rule, as Christine knows, but that 49%, critical, critical. And then, guess what happens after the meeting? You leave a meeting, what happens? I call it the meeting after the meeting. What happens in the meeting after the meeting? People say, 
I wish I had said that in the meeting. Or this is what I really wanted to say in the meeting. Yeah, say it in the meeting. Have the courage, but you got to create a culture. And I didn't go through that piece, but you got to create a culture from the top that allows failure, that allows dissent, that allows debate and discussion. So we changed how we engage. And I believe you can change a company's very operating culture by changing its meeting culture. Other parts of engagement. Remember I talked about the pre-read? Ever heard of a SOAP? What do you think that acronym stands for? Nobody on my team can answer. <laughs> Story on a page. By the way, I learned this technique Full disclosure, I worked for General Electric. I worked for GE Capital in New York City. I was a corporate finance analyst. This is my handiwork circa 1989. <laughs> General Electric had a discipline that said, you are going to put that entire deal. By the way, this was a $100 million financing for none other than Kohl's department stores. I had to put an entire deal on one piece of paper and go present it to Gary Went, then the CEO of GE Capital, which was a daunting experience. But you had to be able to put the entire deal on a page. If you can put a $100 million financing transaction on a page, you can put anything on a page. And that's what we encouraged, if not insisted upon. And by the way, it took root in the company. Again, not 100%, but people start coming into meetings with, hey, I'm going to assume you read the pre-read. I got a one-pager to facilitate a conversation. By the way, did you know that PowerPoint makes us dumb? <laughs> I'm making you dumber by the minute. <laughs> PowerPoint makes us dumb. They've actually now done studies that decisions are poorer for the use of PowerPoint. It is not a discussion and decision tool. It is a sales tool. It has its place, but not in a meeting where you're trying to engage in a real discussion. So this was a tool we used. But it wasn't until, and again, I have Christine Pascalucci to thank for this, and it wasn't until we adopted lean management techniques that I could really foment the bottom-up revolution I was looking to incite from the very beginning. If you're not familiar with lean, and I'm sure all of you are, but very simply stated, it's the inmates running the asylum. That's what it is. It's people closest to the problem solving that problem. Christine drove that at Auto and Home. Now, by the way, these four wedges of the pie should seem very familiar to you. Does it seem like it fits very snugly with strategy, structure, process, people? Modernize, integrate, simplify, develop? Does it profitably solve a customer problem? Is it cross-functional? Does it simplify a process? Does it help us learn and grow? That's how you get alignment. Every piece of that puzzle fits together. Again, no detail, unimportant. So this is how we really started to get to engagement. We're still in that process. It'll continue and it never ends. But it's taking power away from managers who often feel that their power is their knowledge, is their technical skill, and giving it to the people. This is not a benevolent dictatorship. This is the opposite of a benevolent dictatorship. OK, we're on time. All right, so we've gone through creating a wall-headed path. Now we're talking about executing without fear. Here are two contentions that I have. I believe them to my core. Every company today is a technology company, whether it knows it or not, and all competition is based on the ability to compress time. All competition is based today on the ability to compress time. Now, you know I love stories. I'm going to tell you another story. This is about Paul O'Neill, 
who from 1987 to 2000 was the chief executive of Alcoa, the vaunted aluminum company. He had no business experience pretty much prior to being the CEO. He had spent a lot of time in senior posts in the US government. Much like Jack Welch, the first thing he did completely threw his team for a loop. Paul O'Neill said, we are going to focus on one thing and one thing only. Zero tolerance for workplace accidents. Come again? Uh, we're an aluminum company. They thought he was a rube. They said, well, what do you mean we're going to focus on workplace safety as the one thing we're going to focus on? He knew, by the way, if you haven't read this book, great book, Charles Duhigg, Power of Habit. He knew he needed to form a keystone habit that would then infuse the rest of the company with operational excellence. Awesome technique. But this is not why I'm telling you the story. I just like that part. So when he got his team together to first talk about all the ideas, soliciting the ideas for how do we get to zero tolerance for workplace accidents, people started throwing out ideas. And he liked a couple and he said, okay, so when do you think we could do that by? And one of his executives, by the rem remember this is 1987, pulled out their pocket calendar and s started looking at the calendar. I think we can do it. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're looking at a calendar, I'm looking at my watch. You have got to move fast. So I'm not going to go through this word cloud, but all of these things are part of working at clock speed. Agile, for many of you, I know you know this, it's a great tool for software development. It's a cousin of Lean, but companies today that are really successful are adopting Agile techniques. Scrums, sprints, minimum viable product. Got to embed that in your company. Again, if you want to stay relevant, if you want to do more than just survive. Incremental. I am an unabashed incrementalist. I actually don't believe in transformation. Transformation to me is the sum of a ton of incremental improvements. Big bangs generally fail miserably. A mountain of change is built on a mountain of incremental progress. In the same regard, it's about continuous improvement. I'm also not a big fan of the word innovation. I know I'm a bit of a heretic, but I'm not a big fan of the word innovation. You know why? Because it conjures an idea in search of a problem. That's got it wrong. Start with what problem are we trying to solve? Better be a customer problem, but even internal things that may not seem like a customer problem are a customer problem because customers aren't going to pay you for your inefficiency. But what are we going to do to solve that problem? That then becomes, again, this continuous improvement becomes innovation. Two-speed workforce, I've already talked about it. Remember Peter McCullough, Palo Alto Research Center, Park? He actually created a two-speed workforce. Do not find yourself in the slow lane, folks. At one time, I wanted to create a park-like team, a skunk works somewhere else, because we weren't moving fast enough. And I could never get it done. But companies more and more are going to be adopting two-speed workforces, especially legacy companies and legacy industries like insurance, like many of the industries you're in. Minimum viable product. So I was talking to Scott Prop At breakfast, he worked at Motorola. This is John Mitchell, vice president at the time of Motorola. Motorola invented the handheld wireless telephone. In 1973, it invented the first version. Did not hit the market until 1983. They kept, they put something out there, it sucked, and they just kept working on it. By the way, this phone costs $10,000 in today's dollars. It weighed two pounds, 
It held a charge for 20 minutes, and it took 10 hours to charge. <laughs> no one's idea of anything but a minimum viable product, but it was like earth shattering. So anybody remember the movie Wall Street? 1987, Michael Douglas, alias Gordon Gecko, on the beach in the Hamptons holding the brick to his head. I thought it was so cool when I got my first brick. So cool. I'm not cool, but I thought it was cool. So great idea, great idea, but it took a while. Now, innovation cycles, that word I don't like, product cycles are obviously a lot shorter now. You know, companies in Silicon Valley are iterating every two weeks. They're innovating every two weeks. That's the standard, that's the standard. Leveraging adversity, so I talked about executing without fear. Starts with working at clock speed, it's about leveraging adversity, and we'll finish up with performing under pressure. We can learn a lot from nature, especially from this tree. This tree lives in the most inhospitable environment you can possibly imagine. The high desert of California near the White Mountains. Frequent drought, high winds, severe cold, brutally unfertile soil, literally chunks of dolomite this tree grows in. A guy named Edmund Schulman essentially discovered these trees in the mid-50s. Do you know what this tree is? Have you ever seen this tree before? It's called a bristlecone pine tree. And his study of this tree led him to the concept he calls, or called, longevity through adversity. This tree thrives not despite adversity, but because of adversity. Why do we feel adversity? We feel it's our job to avoid adversity. Wrong. Because we all experience it at work, in our lives. In my own personal experiences, I've had my own adversity, professionally speaking, and every time, it's led me to a better place. And if you don't have the courage to face adversity, you will never know what's on the other side. But adversity is great, you know why? Because it forces us to adapt, to become creative. Adversity is really good. Constraints beget creativity. Now, I find these things in the oddest of places. I read this in my alumni magazine, Notre Dame Magazine. And the, the essayist, it was a beautiful essay, had a quote that I just want to read to you, mostly because I just want to read it to you. Um, no, I, I, I love this quote. The trees show us how to live, not only respecting our environment for what it is, but not making extraordinary demands of it. It's an important lesson in how to turn adversity into advantage. I love the bristlecone pine and what it says about adversity. So just like adversity is underrated, so is pressure. U.S. Women's National Team this summer won its fourth World Cup. By the way, the World Cup for women first came in 1991. They won the first one. They've won three more since. They've won four Olympic gold medals since 1996 when women's soccer was first introduced into the Olympic Games. How do they win different players, different eras, same degree of excellence? How do they do it? You know how? By feeding off of high expectations. It's also called the Pygmalion effect. If you expect great things of people, you get great things. If you have low expectations of people, you will get low performance from people. By the way, I love these two players. You remember Brandi Chastain and her signature moment? The other one from this year, University of Wisconsin grad, Rose Lavelle, best player on that team. I love this picture. 20 years, more than 20 years of excellence because they thrive on pressure. They love the moment. By the way, Great article from Sally Jenkins, one of the great sports writers in this country, 
writes for the Washington Post. She wrote an article on July 1st about the U.S. women's national team. Highly encourage you to read that article. It's about pressure. Don't avoid it. Use it. Okay. Now, we're in the par final part of our journey. I know, thank you for being patient. We're going to get you out of here because I know no one's going to have any questions. That's a threat. No. Um, so, this is more about me at this point. But I really want it to be about you. Because again, I said, this comes in three parts. Creating a well-lighted path, executing without fear, and in the process, turning yourself around through continuous learning. I call it playing in traffic. I have played in a lot of intersections in my career. I have taken big risks in my career. I have made big bets in my career. They didn't always pay off. Some of them were abject failures. But in the end, in the rearview mirror, none of them were failures. Just like we talked about the entrepreneur who continuously fails until he or she hits it big, I think I, I, think I in my own way, uh, hit it big. I'm not going to go through the phases of my life. Uh, that would be horrible <laughs> for both me and you. I want to talk about reinvention. I run a personal lines insurance company. Prior to 2011, I never did that before. At the age of 51, I took a flyer. And someone took a flyer on me. You would not look at my resume at that time and say, oh, let's go hire Tom to run this personal lines insurance company. I ran a subsidiary of Allstate, about the same size as Ameriprise Auto and Home, called Encompass. A friend of mine was at Allstate and he said, I know you got no experience, but I think you can do this. I think you're the right person to do this. And by golly, we did it. We did it. And then in 2016, I joined Ameriprise. And we did it again. And it wasn't because of me. Obviously, it wasn't because of me, because everybody around me, and I know they're all here, knows a heck of a lot more than me about any given subject. Anything we're talking about. They're much smarter than me. That's the trick. I reinvented myself by giving myself over to people who know a lot more than me and just provided a dollop of direction, a little glue of decisiveness, hopefully a little bit of inspiration, but unleashed the potential that was unlocking, could be unlocked in this organization. And so I'm now focused on rewirement. I am not going to retire. I will never be an insurance executive again, but I know there are other chapters to write. And so I look forward to figuring out what rewirement means. The other thing is, the thing I learned about constantly learning is you got to play above this line. There are two ways to approach things. You can inquire or you can advocate. So if you're above the line, you are open, curious, and committed to learning. If you are below this line, you are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. I am both beneath and above this line every day. We all are. The only reason I show you this is it's a Jedi mind trick that I use now. I have this in my mind. And I actively think, how am I doing in this meeting? How am I behaving in this meeting? And I say, oh, darn it, I'm below the line. Get above the line. That's where success is, above the line. We're all above and below the line. I'm just saying, maybe this mental trick can help you realize when you're below the line and get above that line. Play yourself under the bristlecone tree. I told you I don't like books. I love books. I just don't read them all the way through. Here's another one. Here's another one. Learned optimism. I did not pick up this book because I wanted to learn how to be optimistic. I picked up this book because I wanted to learn how to lead and manage pessimists. And in the process, I discovered I'm not as optimistic as I think. I've taught myself, it's an act of will, to be positive, to be optimistic. 
The only thing we control is our attitude. I've figured out how to teach myself to be optimistic. But by the way, pessimism is good. Healthy pessimism, you need it. Because if you're an unbridled optimist, that's almost as bad as being an overweening pessimist. You gotta be somewhere in the middle. But Martin Seligman came up, again, very simple, three Ps. He talked about three Ps. Personalization, permanence, and pervasiveness. He said people who are over pessimistic tend to personalize everything. I stink. I failed. They don't give enough credit to randomness, bad luck, and happenstance. So rethink things when you think, I messed up. Maybe you did, but don't take it personally because maybe there was some stuff going on that contributed to that failure. It's okay. The next P, permanence. You think, oh my gosh, I'm always gonna stink at this. I didn't get it right this time, so I'm never gonna get it right. Think about thinking about that differently. Because generally, it's not personal, it's not permanent, and the last one, pervasiveness, people think, I, I stink here, I stink everywhere. I'm no good in this thing, therefore I'm no good. Most things, again, are not permanent, personal, they're not permanent, and they're often very specific. So again, this has helped me. Because I do have a pessimistic side that maybe can get a little too pessimistic. Again, Jedi mind tricks, they work. The last one, one of my favorite games growing up. I used it so often I burned one of them out, had to get another one. <laughs> this actually, this guy has a name, Cavity Sam. This is Cavity Sam. And so I wanted to talk to you about, again, my experience, the anatomy of someone who is built to build businesses, to turn around businesses. <coughs> again, I'm not saying I was the best ever. I'm just saying these are the things that I discovered that helped me along the way become a modestly successful business person. So it starts with listening, really listening really listening. That's what Jessie's doing right now. She's listening. She's not telling, she's listening. Now people say, oh yeah, I listen to my people. No you don't. You're probably below the line. You're probably advocating. Inquiry. Envision. Why do you think they hired you in the first place? They hired you as a leader because they think you can see around the corner. People are inspired to follow you because they think you've got a future orientation and a future that maybe they don't see yet. So listen and then envision. Now, envision is no good unless you communicate it far and wide. I told you about all the ways that we tried to communicate <coughs> the vision for the company. And again, I think we had a modest degree of success. What is a leader really, though, supposed to do? What is the number one job of a leader? There is a right answer to this. What is the number one job of a leader? To get results. That is your job. You must act to get results. I can't tell you in my career how many people in high positions I saw be absolutely paralyzed by decisions move fast and break things. Make a decision, not gonna be fatal, but you have to be accountable. You have to be willing to put your name on that thing. Leaders have to act. Now, Christine will debate me on this, but I've often said to her, if you wanna keep a beer cold, put it next to my heart. She thinks that's not true. It is true. Thank you, Dr. Brees. Thank you for sticking around. <coughs> business people have to make hard decisions. And you gotta think business first. Business first. Business first. 
Your job is to get results. Now, it comes with a codicil. It comes with a caveat. Hard-headed in how you make business decisions, soft-hearted in how you implement them. Yes, Christine, I'm a people person. But it starts with a very cold heart from a business perspective. And then the last part, which is the quality that defines successful leaders, or at least the ones I like, a sense of humor. Everything goes down easier with a sense of humor. And actually, it's not just a theory. I love to read about neuroscience. I love to read about psychology. You are more persuasive when you are having fun. You are more successful when you incorporate humor into your day. And so I remember some of our colleagues from American Family, they would come to a meeting in our pre-integration phase and we'd be yucking it up. And it's like, what are you guys doing? Like, stop having so much fun. Any rate, listen, I'm going to miss this community. I'm going to miss my team. I want to thank them all who are here. Uh, I am simply reflecting the story that they wrote. I did not write this story. They wrote this story. But as all good leaders do, I am taking all the credit. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Now, like I promised, we're going to get you out of here. I did have a little more content than I thought. Thank you for being so gracious with your time. Any questions? Any questions? OK, thank you all. Have a great day. Enjoy this beautiful fall day. Just really quickly in closing, uh, I want to say thank you to Tom and thank you to everyone for coming out this morning. Uh, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, see please Lisa Gray. Uh, Lisa, raise your hand so everybody knows. So uh, she'll be more than happy to send you uh, a copy. And then please join us for our next CEO breakfast on November 5th here on campus. Uh, Chris Waleski, uh, CEO of Bell and Health Systems, is going to present on Medicare for All. So we hope to see you there. and. Have a great day.